everyone, welcome today. My name is Vanessa Bartlett and it's a pretty exciting day because I'm actually interviewing Dr. John Martini, who is a world uh, published author, a speaker, an educator, and has actually read over 30,000 books. I can't even comprehend that number. <laughs> 30,000, how long has it taken you to read that many books? Uh, 47 years. <laughs> Seven years, and you've studied all disciplines under the sun in terms of academia. Study, try to study everything I can get my hands on. Very interesting. And today I'm going to be asking Dr. Di Martini more so about stress management, how we can actually deal with uh, our health in busy life today, and maintain motivation for health and fitness, even though sometimes we may not like to do that. So I'm in a space of helping people to stay healthy and fit, but I'd love to get your opinion on a few of those questions today to help us. That's great. Okay. Fantastic. Excellent. Now, firstly, I just wanted to ask you, how did you actually get started in this space and what's driven you to kind of do what you do and teach around the world in so many different disciplines to empower people? You know, I was uh, learned challenged uh, when I was young. And I was told in my, by my first grade teacher that I would never be able to read, never be able to write, never be able to communicate, never be able to anything, never go very far in life. I had learning problems, speech problems. And um, so I ended up dropping out of school. I was a street kid and eventually hitchhiked out to California because I picked up surfing along the way. And I went surfing in California and Mexico and eventually over to Hawaii. And I was living in Hawaii and I nearly died there, had a mm -hmm. real close call with a brush with death. And an amazing teacher, I was led to a class, an amazing teacher named Paul Bragg. And in one night, in one hour, his one message really got to me and made me believe that I could overcome my learning problems wow. and overcome my health problems. And that was the night I had a dream and a vision to travel the world, um, overcome my learning problems, learn to read, uh, learn to teach and be like him and inspire people as a teacher. So it was really a life-changing moment or day, so to speak. It was definitely. And recently, uh, I'm 65, going on 66 now, but recently I went over to the North Shore and I surfed and I went to the same locations and surfed the same places. That's just, pretty cool. Just about a, six weeks ago. Yeah. So it's pretty cool to actually go back and That's do it That's amazing. Again. Had you been back there since? Occasionally I've been there, but not right. actually surfing on those same spots Aww. on big waves. So I, I made a commitment at 65 I was going to surf North Shore big waves. So I did. That's amazing. What a nice thing to kind of revisit because it really is what sparked it off for you and you've been around the world to all sorts of countries. Um, I'd love to um, ask you actually and dive straight in here. Now I've been following you for a while myself and I'd like to ask how determining our values actually help with more motivation to stay fit and healthy. So let's say for example someone wants to get start exercising and stay healthy. I know that you talk a lot about determining your values, otherwise you're not going to prioritize that particular goal. Can you explain what our values are and how we can determine them? Yeah. Every individual lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most important to least important in their life at any moment. And whatever they perceive, decide, and do is based on them. And that set of values um, determines their uh, their perception, decisions, and actions in such a way that their, their life's journey is a result of that pursuit, fulfilling those values. Right. So whatever's highest on your value, you're spontaneously inspired to do. Whatever's low on your values, you need external motivation to get yes. you to do. So when somebody doesn't really, really, really have extremely high value on fitness and edu edu you know exercise and nutrition and things that are health-oriented, then and without some sort of extrinsic motivation to keep them reminded of doing it, they're probably going to fall by the wayside and go off and do whatever is more important in their life. Because every decision that an individual makes is based on what they believe will give them the greatest advantage over disadvantage to what they value most at any moment. So an individual that says, oh, I, they, may, they go through a little period where they may not feel so great and they go, okay, I want to start an exercise program, I want to start working out, yes. I want to start eating better. Most of it fades away if it's not truly their highest value. And if it is truly a highest value, they're already living it. Yeah. They don't need to be motivated. They wouldn't have to they, start They spontaneously anyway. do it. And as a result of it, there's a way you can link values. So you can ask yourself, how specifically is exercising, eating wisely, um, eating natural foods, and, 
and things of this nature. How specific is helping you do what is currently highest on your value? Right. And if we make enough links, they'll increase the engagement level of the exercise or the, the nutritional approaches that lead them to what they want in life. If yeah. they can see their actions that are health oriented on the way towards what they value most, or if they raise the value of those actions that are known to be helpful to well-being on their values, they'll automatically do it. Otherwise, right. they need to be motivated, and they're going to have to have a trainer or somebody pushing them along and keeping yes. them on track. And that's okay. That, that works for many people. But having an intrinsic drive to do something is way more profound and more sustainable long-term than transient motivations from extrinsic sources. Right. So having that... Like you said, if someone genuinely dislikes exercise, I know I come a lot across a lot of people who genuinely dislike the movement. They go, "Oh, no, I have to do it," but I don't. I just really can't be bothered. If they can link that mentally to something else that is a value or a high priority in their life, you're saying that's kind of the way to get around that issue. Yes, I had a gentleman that was at work, and uh, he found out that some of his buddies were out on the golf course and closing deals, bigger deals than he was. And so he thought, maybe I ought to do it, but I don't really like golf, and I'm not really an exercise buff and everything else. And so I just asked him a series of questions, because the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. Yes. How specifically is going golfing going to enhance the income and the productivity at your business? And I made him answer that about, about 40 times. Wow. Over about an hour. He just kept going, and we dug deeper and dig deeper and dug deeper. And every time we do, we're neuroplastically remyelinating the pathways in our brain. So when we start to think of going golfing or going and exercising is now helping us get what we want, we naturally have a yearning to want to go and do what is most valuable to us. Yes. So I made links, 40 links, and it was about two weeks later that he actually went out on the golf course and actually closed a big deal. And the moment he closed a deal, and that was not a, I mean, a big deal to him, it was like $60,000. So that $60,000 made him go, wow. Yes. One, one golf course thing, 60 grand. So he then started linking and associating with, and he found out every time he went golfing, every five times on golf, on average, he was closing deals of at least 50,000. So that's $10,000 a, a golf session. Gosh. So as a result of paying 1,000 to go make 10,000 uh, a session, he's like going, this is a good return on my investment. So once Same. he saw it from what he valued, which is business and finance, mm. once it was linked, he was in. So it's about linking whatever is low on your values to that which is higher on the values. So it's an intrinsic drive to go do it. So you don't sure. need to be motivated to do it. Sure. But it's sort of a, a self-governing intrinsic motivation link process that's, that makes the difference. Yeah. And if you do, you can take almost any activity that's health related and link it to whatever you value today. Maybe um, relationships or or any other area of life it could be finance, social, spirituality. I've had people link how doing their exercise is spiritual, and because yes. their highest value is spiritual quest, they started doing. They go, oh, and they realize that yoga and exercise and stretching was stretching their mind and opening their mind to a, a broader perspective, yeah. which was in their eyes spirituality. So once you link it, then you, they do it spontaneously. So for example, a lot of people I come across are busy parents, busy mums with young children who really go, oh my gosh, too tired, can't be bothered, but they know they have to keep up with their toddler and they want to be a good grandparent in years to come and take care of themselves. So how can we kind of link that for those type of people? Well, if, if, if they find out that their highest value is their children and being a great mother, if they can't see how exercise is going to help them be a great mother, they're not going to do it. Mm. People are only engaged in things they see on the way to what they value most, not in the way. So they'll see, oh, that's in the way. I've got my kids. I've I got to focus on my kids. But if they can see how the exercise is going to help the kids, and the fastest way I've found mothers to get them engaged that way is to ask them, do you believe that they learn by what we say or by what we live? And they'll go, by what we live. So exemplification is still the greatest teacher. Yes. So do you have a desire for your child to understand the significance of their physical well-being, health, and their nutrition? Yes. So do you think that you exemplifying it, it was actually more cost-effective and time-effective than mm. actually just talking about it and not doing it? And he's seeing one thing, and his mirror neurons are responding to what you do instead of what you say. So do you think it's actually to your advantage to do that? And it gives you time to feel better and more, more profound. Sure. And when you feel uh, that you're more fit, you're more, in a sense, self-attractive. You, your self-worth goes up. And I started stacking up all the things that she was 
watching a road because she was so focused on her kids. Yes. And then I realized that you, you keep in shape, your self-worth goes up, your opportunities go up, uh, your exposure, your social networking, which is normally shut down because you're so focused on the child. I started linking enough of those things in the seven areas of her life where she started to go, I'm, I'm going for walks, I'm just going to start doing a little bit of stretching. Yes. I'm going to go out and, and do a little bit of jogging, and I'm going to run my little child in the little racer, you know. And all of a sudden, she saw it from a different perspective. And yeah. then she realized that that's for the sake of the child. Yes. Because their highest value is their children at that time. Right. That's fantastic. I love it. I think that's a really good, clear answer to that one. Um, the next question I have for you is, so it's New Year's at the moment. Well, it's going on to the second month of the year. But why do New Year's resolutions not last for people? So during the holidays, most people have overeaten and underacted. And so they have a temporary void that makes them go, you know what, I want to go on a health fitness routine where I'm going to eat wisely, I'm going to spend my money less, I'm going to get out and exercise, I'm not going to overeat, because they temporarily have a little void. But after two or three or four weeks back into their routine, after the holidays, they kind of go back on track and they, they, they moderate their behavior again. And so the void that drove that yearning to do a, a New Year's resolution disappears, mm. and so they just fades. It's not wise to set any New Year's resolutions on anything that's not really truly intrinsically high on your values because it's not likely to stick. Right. And if you, if you really have it high on your values, you're already doing it. So the idea of a New Year's resolution, I've, I usually don't waste my time on. Sure. I usually set goals throughout the year. I don't mind doing them at the beginning of the year, but I, I, I like setting goals that are truly, I show evidence that I'm committed to. Because mm. that one, those, if you set a goal that's aligned with your highest values and it's really truly congruent and authentic to what's meaningful to you, you'll do it. And you will build momentum and you'll end up with self-worth growing up and, and expanding instead of sitting there beating yourself up going, I set a goal, it doesn't happen. Yeah. And then you self-defeat. And then it goes back to square one the following year or six to 12 months when you get that. that yeah, I saw somebody, I, 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 Almost every December, January, I'm writing articles on New Year's resolution. Yes. I mean, it's, it's standard. And it's the same articles repeated and slightly edited <laughs> most of the time. But people, I, I've watched people literally set goals that I know there's no way they're going to stick to them. Right. Because it's a temporary thing that's happened. And it's nothing. And I tell them, I stop them sometimes. I said, do you really believe that? And they'll go, no. <laughs> I said, don't waste your time. Anytime you set a goal that's not really truly congruent, it's not really truly meaningful and inspiring to you that you're intrinsically drive, driven to do, you self-defeat. Yes. It's, it's, it's self-depreciating. So don't waste your time on goals that aren't truly most important. Yes. Ones that you have certainty, what you have a track record and you're committed to. So really it comes back to, again, linking it to your highest value and then making that something that's ongoing all year round. Yeah, I don't, need to, I don't, need, to, I don't need to set a goal to do my research, or my teaching, or my traveling, or or eating wisely, I don't because that's spontaneously high in my values. Right. Because I I want to perform, and I don't live to eat. I eat to live. Mm. And so when I eat, I make sure it's refined and focused and gives me maximum performance levels yes. and energy levels. So if it doesn't give me maximum performance, I don't I don't waste my time. As far as I'm concerned, the purpose of food is not for just pleasure. The purpose of food yeah. is to maximize your overall well-being and productivity in your life. I love that, and it's actually adding purpose to it. So having a purpose kind of behind why you're exercise why you eat so that's a really good reason as yeah, well yeah and I think when you have people yeah, if you have a, a pardon me for just saying it because you got a, a baby looks I like do, yes <laughs> but but there are women out there that are about to get married right yeah and they're three to four weeks out for those three to four weeks right before that that marriage ceremony when they're going to have that one picture that's going to be sitting there on their their mantle for the rest of their life they will make sure that they're disciplined, reliable, they're focused, yes. they eat wisely, they'll do it. They'll make sure for that one day. Now, the day after the marriage, <laughs> they've lost it all. I was going to say that I've had so many clients over the years who train incredibly disciplined for that three to six months before the wedding, and they're no longer my clients after the wedding. I yeah. don't know what happened to them. Because they have a purpose there. And when they have yes. a purpose bigger than themselves, they'll, they'll, they'll yeah. get governed. Anytime you're doing something that's high in your values, your blood glucose and oxygen goes into the executive center of the brain, the forebrain, and there you have self-governance, you have an inspired, clear vision, you have a strategy that you follow, and you're ready to execute it. That's where you maximize your performance, right. and that's where you grow as an individual. And so wasting your time on anything less than that on a value list as a goal, to me, is self-defeating, because that wakes up the amygdala. And the amygdala is an impulse instinct center, and it's basically a desire That's center. That's the survival Survival part, right? center, and it's basically just wants desire and to consume. Mm -hmm. So it overeats. It, it, it wants ease, not workouts. It wants to relax. It wants pleasure. 
So that's not the center to grow fitness. The right. center to grow fitness is the executive center. So we can also tap into that as well by linking what we were saying before. Um, but what's another way that we can actually activate that part of the brain now that we're on Schedule that? very important things on a daily basis. If you don't fill your day with high-priority actions mm-hmm. and inspire you, your day's going to fill up with low-priority distractions. At right. When you're doing low-priority distractions, don't you're unfulfilled and the amygdala comes online and the desire and consumption center comes online and yes. you want to go consume and spend money on things you don't need, that are consumer built appreciates, and you want to consume food and sugar, which causes all the health issues. And glycation is one of the biggest things that causes skin problems and everything else because mm. of sugar consumption. But if you're doing something you know it's extremely meaningful and extremely important over the next days or weeks, you're very disciplined and you're very, you're, you live not to eat, but eat to live. Right. And that makes the difference. So interesting. And that's such a good point, I think, for busy people is actually scheduling and being disciplined in that one thing alone. Schedule on a daily basis the highest priority actions that are most important, most meaningful, most yeah. inspiring to you. And you'll be amazed at how disciplined you can be on your, your lifestyle and eating uh, and your workout routines. Because it's not about uh, forcing you to do it. It's about, mm-hmm. it's just, uh, you're, you're, you're living in the idea, I want maximum outcome. So for the people who watch this and say well you know it's easy to say if you're not so busy or if you've got um you know so many i don't know three children or something or busy life and a partner and things i think what comes up is a lot of is excuses and and this idea of guilt of taking that hour out to the, to do exercise or plan the meals for the week to take the stress off and eat better a lot of people come into kind of a barrier with that what's the goal around feeling guilty about this and asking people for help especially for busy mums and things guilt is an assumption that what you've done with your actions has caused more pain than pleasure more loss and gain more negative than positive more disadvantage advantage to someone so if you think that that's causing a disadvantage to your your children or your family that has projected expectations on you then you're going to end up holding yourself back with guilt but if you ask how's it helping the child how's it helping my mother's watching over who has a different view about how i'm supposed to raise a kid how's it helping the people that i'm feeling guilty relating to yeah and see the advantages are equal to the disadvantages you walk through the guilt and dissolve it and you move forward and then you make prioritized actions interesting and if you fill your day with really high priority actions your self-worth goes up your confidence and you're resilient to it and adaptab- adaptability goes up, which is health related, yes. health, health and promoting, it's you stress, not distress. And you're again, you're exemplifying what's possible for the child. If you're not prioritizing your life and sticking to the highest priorities and saying no to everything else, you're mm. training a child to live in desperation, not inspiration. Interesting. And they pick up so much from a very young age we know as well. I'd love to ask you now, how can we actually remain stress free and maintain what we call balance in a busy life? Well, stress is the inability to adapt to a changing environment, and the, the environment is changing constantly. Yes. And the, the res, result of stress, because of the change, is the perception of loss of that which we attach to, or the perception of gain of the things we're detached from. Mm-hmm. So anything we're seeking, we fear the loss of. Anything that we're trying to avoid, we, seek the, we, we fear the gain of it. So our stresses are those, the fear of loss of that which we seek and the fear of gain of that which we're trying to avoid. So if we have a very polarized, very biased, very subjectively distorted view about life that we're highly attracted or repelled from things with high emotional states, we're more distressed. But if we live by our highest values and live by priority, we move into a more objective area of the brain that's more reasonable and has more resilience and adaptability. And in that place, we don't have these skewed views. We have this more balanced view of life. As a result of it, the goals are more balanced, our reactions to people are more balanced, our perceptions of ourselves and others are more balanced, and we have de- decreasing stress. We have actually used stress, which is wellness promoting, instead of distress, which is illness promoting. So stress is kind of a, not really a thing. It's not really real. There's nothing outside us that's the stress. People don't get that. People want to blame. Yes. They want to give credit for things and get blame for things instead of realize it was their perception yes. that's the source of all that. Wow. And William James uh, in 1895 said that the greatest discovery of his generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their perceptions and attitudes of mind. Your perceptions, your decisions, your actions are what you have control over, nothing else. So if you don't have a way of transforming your perception, decisions, and actions, the world on the outside makes you the victim of your history instead right. of you becoming the master of your destiny. And then you're kind of looking outside for the blame and the reason and Then you why look for some something's... solutions outside yourself. But the solution yes. is never outside and the cause is never outside. Yeah. 
it's about your perception of those worlds and, and what your decision and actions are as a result of that. And that kind of leads me to the next question then, this point of people hitting burnout. So burnout's a bit of a word these days, like I've had adrenal fatigue myself, but you're probably right in terms of the perception of what was deemed stressful at the time was a misperception or a misconception in my own brain or perhaps other people facing this same dilemma of burnout and fitting it all in. What's no. your take on that? I, I'm going to challenge the, this whole model because burnout is actually your friend. And people go, what? How can you say that? Burnout is letting you know that you're pursuing low priority actions on a daily basis and scattering yourself, trying to please too many people that are being opportunists, trying to take mm. up your time and doing low priority distractions instead of sticking to the highest priority thing. So your burnout feeling or your boredom feeling is just trying to get you feedback to let you know you're not prioritizing your life. And saying no to things that are low in priority from others and saying yes to things that are truly intrinsically a drive that's inspiring to you. Wow. So it's not a bad thing. It's a feedback to let you know you're not pursuing what's authentic and what's inspiring to you. If you prioritize your day, you change your life. And I, I, I basically have delegated everything else out. People, people go, well, how do you do that? And I say, well, I just simply go and do what I love doing. I make mm. sure that it serves people. It earns an income. It pays for the people I delegate the rest of the stuff to. So I don't do low priority things. So you said you do basically four or five things Research, a day. Research, write, travel, teach. That's it. Yeah. Teach one on one. Teach one on groups. Teach one on media. That's but, amazing. But in the process of doing it, I don't have distress because of that. Because I'm not. I've delegated everything else that if I was doing low priorities on that I'd have the distress responses from, I've delegated it out. Have you learned that yourself by being in a place of stress where you went, no, you know what, from now on I'm going to delegate X, Y, Z? Have you been there yourself? Yes. When I was 27 years old, almost 28, I was uh, in practice at the time. And I was doing a little of everything. I was literally doing low priority stuff and filling my day and busy instead of productive. Like what? Well, I was in practice at the time. Okay. So I was doing everything from exams, so your analysis, blood analysis, right. I was doing everything that you can do in a practice, and that was, it had to be me doing it. I was realized I was kind of feeling this burnout frustration thing. I went over to the bookstore, Walden's bookstore that was in existence at the time, and I bought a book called uh, The Time Trap by Alec McKenzie. When I sat in, I read that book, I'd go, ooh, my God, that's me. That's me. I'm, I'm trapped. Right. I don't have enough time to get it all done because I think it's all important and I need to do it. Well, over the next 18 months, I uh, delegated 99% of everything off, off my plate. My business tenfolded in, in increase in volume and income. I hired people to do everything, and I never looked back. I realized at age 28 that that was, that's done. I'm not doing low priority things. It's my life. Yeah. I don't want to spend my life doing something that's not inspiring. That's great. I love it. And I think a lot of people have maybe come to that point, but perhaps we kind of push it away and ignore it sometimes to keep going. Well, but we can get in our way if we think that we, we think we're the only one that can do it. We think yeah. by the time I yeah. trained them, they, right. I could have done it. There's all kind of excuses why you yeah. come up with it. But the reality is if you don't liberate yourself from the low priority of things, you're going to devalue yourself. Yeah. You're going to constrain what you're capable of doing. And you're going to, as you treat yourself with lower uh, effect, the world treats you that way. Mm. Till you value yourself with high priorities, the world's not going to. Interesting. Fantastic that this leads to the next question because another thing you mention a lot of is not subordinating to others in life. Um, and you also say not to put other people on a pedestal, so to speak. This is kind of going in a different direction now, but what, what does that actually do to us? What is the issue that you believe behind subordinating to others or putting well, others on let a me, pedestal? Let me give a story first that might relate to the audience. Sure. I was working with a uh, supermodel, very, very beautiful, voted to one of the most beautiful women in the world at the time. And she had body dysmorphia. Mm. And she didn't realize how beautiful she was. Everybody else could see it, and they all wanted to take pictures of her, but she couldn't see it. Because what she was doing is she was taking the hair of this other supermodel, even though that other supermodel overall didn't have any more beauty, her hair was, was gorgeous. So she was comparing her hair to that girl's hair. Then she was comparing her breast to those girls' breasts and comparing her thighs to that girl's breast. All these different people with one area that was exceptional, she wow. was comparing all of her body parts to that and couldn't see the beauty of any of her parts. And as a result of it, we had to do what I call the Demartini method to clear that, which is I, what I teach in the break to experience. But once we did, she freed herself up. Instead of having them up on a pedestal, she leveled the playing field and got to see her beauty and broke down in tears of gratitude for herself for the first time in her wow. life. Wow. Now, this dysmorphia, is that's a physical one, but it happens with business. Yes. Men and women have an uh, idea, they go, well, they're more successful in business, I'm not. Uh, they're more intelligent, I'm not. 
So we can have subordinate to people because of their intelligence, their business savvy, their finances, their relationship uh, yep. balance uh, or, or quality, um, their social influence, how many people they got on Facebook. <laughs> we can do it on their physical fitness or beauty. We can do it on their spiritual awareness or inspiration. And as long as we compare ourselves to others instead of compare our own daily actions to our own highest values, we're going to self-defeat. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the transcendentalist, said, envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. Because the second you put them on a pedestal, you'll inject their values into your life, right. try to live in their values, not your own, mm -hmm. cloud the clarity of what you're called to do, where you're most productive, and then you'll end up having difficulty saying no to people on the outside. You'll say yes, because you self-depreciate. And anytime you self-depreciate, you give more power to other people than yourself. Wow. Did you get that? <laughs> Um, that's really interesting because I think a lot of mental health issues these days, like we hear anxiety, you know, um, again, the burnout thing being thrown around a lot. Do you think it's to do with, do you think social media has kind of having, had an impact on that with people going, oh, young kids getting, you know, depression because of more likes on Facebook and Instagram than their peers and this kind of thing. What, what do you kind of well, take on that? Well, I wouldn't blame that? social media because I think that's unfair to blame some technology. Technology mm. is used by human beings and it's their choice of how they're using it. Yeah. Uh, I use social media for marketing. I don't watch social media every day. I don't keep an eye on everybody. I don't pay attention to that because I got, I'm too busy doing what I'm, I'm writing articles or sure. speaking. But social media is not the cause. Social media is a means of how we are perceiving the world outside. If we see somebody in a mall walking by and we imagine them greater than us and now us less, we used to do it just firsthand. But now we can go anywhere in the world on social media. And so we're doing the same thing, but yeah. it's not the media. It's just that's a vehicle to have it expand to more people. Yeah. It's our behavior on the media, the use of the media, the, the factor. So I don't want to blame the social media, even though people are believing that somebody's yeah. nice picture that's their nicest picture that's probably been cropped yes. is the picture. Their real life is not. I learned that years ago when I was in my 20s when I met this super beautiful lady. When I saw a picture on the magazine, when I saw her in real life, it wasn't what, what happened here. <laughs> that wasn't the lady. Yeah. But I realized that they had filtered it and cleaned up the picture. So we can sometimes be fooled by that, and our own ignorance is the cause, not the social media and technology. How can we help kids, though, who may not be aware of that? Educate level? them. Yeah, so I'd educate education. them on how social media is and mm. as long as they compare themselves and, exad and yep. give them an education. Education is what liberates people from these emotional bondages that we get trapped in. Sure. So educate them. I, I think there's no reason why we can't tell children that if you're watching social media, don't be fooled by pictures. They're going to put their best up there, not yep. their average. Yes. And, and when, if you do, then you're going to compare yourself to what your average is and then you're going to compare it and you beat yourself up. Yeah. And you're going to want to put only yours on there. But then if you go out on a date and you only show your nice picture, if you have the less picture, they're going to feel let down. Yes. Better put your ugly picture up there. And if you get a date, then you're going to look like a win. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so <laughs> Learn so, to spin it when we need to. <laughs> so we need to use it wisely and educate yes. people about how to use these yeah, things. Yeah, that's good advice. Considering all the disciplines you've studied out of all of these 30,000 books and your knowledge on the mind-body connection, so back to kind of health, things like um, in terms of fitness, yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, meditation, these these more mind-body approaches towards health and fitness. What's your take on that? Do you believe that we need to to integrate more of these sorts of disciplines in busy life today to kind of take care of ourselves? Well, it depends on what your primary objective is. Um, I don't think that meditation, I mean, it's been around for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we know for at least 2,600 years. Right. But before that, I'm sure. Uh, meditation, if used wisely and not as an escape and not as a way of of uh, subduing yourself to such a degree you're not productive has been shown the merits of it from as far as biochemistry and, and immunological we yes. know that Pilates is also a, a less injurious um, means of doing things that allow flexibility tone and, yes. and body things so anytime we learn new strategies that can assist us on being more fit I think it's to our advantage yeah but I think that I don't want to make it where if you don't do it you know you're gonna suffer sure because some people work in the garden and they go for walks and they go dancing and they love make or whatever as their exercise program but these are exercises that are, are now that have emerged that allow people to maximize the use of all their body parts all yes. the joints 
all their muscles to maximize tone scientifically. So yeah. I think that it's uh, to our advantage to learn at least learn about them and to link them high enough on our values where we put them into some sort of routine. And doing something that you enjoy is also really important. So if someone is gardening and getting out for a walk and that's that, well, yes. heck, it's better than nothing. Some of the longest living people I've seen are people that walk a lot. Yes. They love walking in nature. Absolutely. But it also helps. I've noticed that uh, <laughs> uh, I've seen that when there's a very handsome or a very beautiful individual that's the trainer that's training on that, the appeal to right. that that uh, that sex appeal also gets people out there to the gym. <laughs> I've seen yes. that over and over. Because I had a guy that was in my practice years ago that looked kind of like a Mel Gibson when he was in young. Right. And I was amazed at how many females started coming in as yes. patients. Unbelievable. They were just flocking in because of this guy, this doctor. So we might find that that could be a useful tool to get us because <laughs> we link it to our one of our highest values. If we're single, particularly, and we're looking for a mate, if we right. if we have something that's very attractive to look at, it sparks up a there little you bit. Go, of some out so there. you can link it to your uh, higher value of a beautiful beauty and attractiveness. Certainly, certainly do that. No, that's awesome. Um, did you have any final tips on how we can stay healthy and fit in busy life today, Dr. D. Martini? Yeah, I I, th I would say first of all, on a daily basis, ask yourself what is the highest priority action I can do today that can fulfill the most meaningful, most inspiring, most productive um, thing I could be accomplishing today. That's in my, what I, my mission, I feel my mission is. Then you want to ask, what is the highest uh, performing foods that I could be eating yeah. to maximize that, that result? Okay. Uh, so you're prioritizing what you're, who you're hanging out with, you're prioritizing what you're eating, you're prioritizing what you're feeding your mind with, reading, yes. you're prioritizing uh, uh, your daily actions, you're prioritizing your business transactions, you're prioritizing how you're spending your money so it's not just impulse buying. If you do, your overall well-being yeah. will go up. Your resilience and adaptability will go up. Mm. And the probability of you beating yourself up uh, goes down. Interesting. And that's the whole thing, isn't it? Well-being isn't just about exercise and pounding yourself doing weights. It's this holistic look at I think different areas of life and learning to integrate all of those and that's some really really great tips to doing that yeah when I was uh, preparing for the surfing on uh, in the North Shore was this the recent surf the recent surf yeah uh, I didn't have a, a waves every day where I was because I full-time travel around the world so as I'm constantly doing it so I was literally crawling on a bed <laughs> scratching on a bed to, to paddle on a bed uh, early in the morning and doing push-ups and sit-ups and everything and preparing for this getting ready because I knew I was going to go out in big waves. Wow. And and one time the lady knocked on the door and came in from the thing and saw me scratching up. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, may I ask what you're doing? This is and my I daily said, exercise I'm preparing, routine. I'm preparing for my big waves riding in North Shore and surfing here in a few weeks. <laughs> and she goes, okay, just curious. <laughs> But you got to get. You also okay. have some fun because if you're doing something you love to do that's inspiring, and you have some fun doing it, you have a higher probability with the endorphins and kefalons, right? Uh, dendorphins, I think, to go out and make it a pattern. I love it. Well, I think that that wraps it up for today. That's some pretty darn good advice. Go back and rewatch this because this is an awesome interview. Thanks for having me, and thank you so much for your time today, Dr. John D. Martini. Thank you. See you soon.